All right, I just want to uh, thank the Lord and Pastor Pazarnsky for this opportunity to preach. It's always a blessing to preach here. Um, my sermon title is called Discord Among Brethren. Discord Among Brethren. And if you would go to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So why preach a sermon like this? You know, everyone's, uh, you know, a part of this great church. We're growing. We're doing a lot of um, soul winning, right? And so why preach a, a sermon like this that sort of uh, can come across as a negative sermon? But that's the reason why I'm preaching this is because we're a growing church and because we do a lot of soul winning. And so I want to instill uh, defense against that. And when it happens, so you won't be, you won't actually be uh, offended when this kind of stuff happens. So we're in a great season right now. We're growing and doing a lot of soul winning. But let's try to protect against um, all this discord. And I'll go into more um, about what I mean in a moment here. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's take a look at uh, verses 18 through 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 through through 19. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So first part of point number one is division in a body of believers stems from heresies. So um, oftentimes when you hear people bickering and complaining about stuff, there's always something in there that's not right, that's a heresy. Now, it's not damnable heresy per se. There's a difference between heresy and damnable heresy, but there's still heresies nonetheless. And so when people are bickering and arguing about heresies, um, or they're, they're bickering and arguing, there's usually a heresy involved, and people argue over a couple of things. There's only one of those uh, people are right or they're both wrong. You can't have, you know, both people be right. That's where the arguing comes from. So let's turn uh, to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and if you will, uh, please keep a uh, bookmark in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at um, Galatians chapter 5, verses 17, 19, and 20. Galatians chapter 5, 17, 19 and 20. So it reads, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Uh, on to 19 and 20. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. So those, that's where the, the, uh, the heresies come into play there. Um, so you can always be sure that wherever there's arguing uh, and discord, there's going to be heresies involved of some form or another. A uh, perfect example of this would be uh, the pre-trib versus post-trib rapture doctrine. Now, most of us here, obviously, probably virtually all of us, believe in the post-trib um, post-trip theology, but there's people out there that will basically unfriend you or stop talking to you because you believe in post-trip, right? A lot of the pre-tribbers are like this. Uh, I met plenty of people online. I mean, I've met people um, that were actually kicked out of churches because of this doctrine. Now, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that supports you should stop fellowshiping with people over, um, you know, end times doctrine. I mean, if you can find it, you know, let me know after the service, but it's not in there. And so if you don't share the same um, doctrine as other people do in that regard, then whatever, it's not a big deal. There's no reason to stop fellowship over it. Um, so that's, you know, there's things like that that will come up, um, but, you know, let that not be said of us, um, you know, that we would stop fellowshiping with each other just because of secondary doctrines. Um, and, yeah, I mean, just people arguing, you know, people arguing about um, secondary doctrines, grow up, be mature about it, and just move on. 
Num uh, this other point to uh, sub point for point number one um, is bickering over personal standards. Bickering over personal standards can drive a wedge between believers. So let's have a look at, let's go to Romans 14. I love Romans 14, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. So Romans 14 is a chapter on standards, really great chapter on standards with, it's really in depth actually with um, the way it discusses standards, how they should be, how we should apply them and how we should be careful about um, being overbearing with our own personal standards against other people. So Romans 14, 3 through 5 says, uh, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So this is something that really, I guess, kind of gets to me because you know, you come into a great church, you, have a, you come into a soul-winning church, you have great preaching, you have good doctrine, doctrine that's not being preached out there in the world. Everyone fully well knows that here. And then you have people bickering over personal standards. Seriously, you vote, you don't vote, people arguing over if you vote or not, people arguing over what kind of diet you, you have, um, you're keto, you're not keto, whatever. I mean, I've just heard so many ridiculous um, stories, and I've, I've seen it, unfortunately. And I mean, I've heard, you know, going back to the COVID thing, you know, you wore a mask, or your kid wears a mask, or they don't do it. Go back to verse um, 4 right here. It says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Right? So God's able to make you stand doesn't matter what you eat. doesn't matter if, you, if you're a vegetarian or whatever, or if you're a vegan. God's able to make you stand, right? And the Bible talks about, you know, uh, people that eat herbs are weak, right? But um, when it comes to different diets and stuff, I mean, I've heard from Pastor um, Joe Jones. He actually made a really good, uh, really, he actually did a really good sermon about this, about how people can actually eat junk food their whole life and then, have perfect, awesome blood tests. They'd be like, what are you feeding this guy? Nothing. He just eats junk food all day, right? And so if, if, we're, if we're in a, a good Bible-believing Baptist church, do you really think that God's going to, you know, he's not going to make you stand if you have, if there's variances in your diet or whatever? And so we shouldn't argue and bicker over personal preferences and uh, personal standards, um, that's just ridiculous. And just know if you, if you ever meet a man like that who's always poking and prodding at your standards or whatever, he's not a secure man. That's a man that um, is very insecure, right? And so he's always looking for some chink in your armor, um, whether you wore a mask, whether you took the shot or whatever. And there's all kinds of doctrine that goes, goes into not taking the shot. I get that. But, you know, voting, not voting, um, just ridiculous, ridiculous things. I mean, I've seen people nearly get into fights over this garbage, right? So let that never uh, ever be said of us getting into fights over um, standards. So uh, we all come from different backgrounds. We don't all see, see things the same, and God affords us the ability to choose our own personal standards how we see fit. We're all, we're all different members of the same body, so there's no reason to bicker and argue over that. Uh, now going to Romans 14:15. Romans 14, 15 says this right here. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. So this kind of goes to the other end here, um, using our liberties wisely. So I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, into the context of this um, particular passage, but, you know, Paul said if his eating meat would offend, he wouldn't, eat, he wouldn't eat meat at all anymore, right? So we want to be uh, sensitive to other people. We don't want to just use our own personal standards as like a hammer just to hit them over the head with it. Be, be 
conscious of uh, what you're doing around other people, right? Don't use your liberties and your good. Don't let it be evil spoken of. So if you know your brother is weaker in the faith and he just can't handle certain things, there's no reason to just, you know, start eating a bunch of, uh, if he's a vegetarian or whatever, just start eating a bunch of uh, Big Macs in front of him. You know, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be too wise. That wouldn't be too charitable towards that person. Now, obviously, as he grows and matures in, in Jesus Christ, um, you know, maybe he'll get on a different diet or maybe he understands that, you know, the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink and things will change, right? Everyone's growing all the time. But point being, we shouldn't use our liberties and our own personal standards um, against somebody else. So be sensitive enough to adjust the way you act, adjust the way you interact with other people in the church, right? So don't think about yourself all the time. Think about the other person in front of you, the person next to you. Always think about other people before yourselves, right? And so moving on to um, church standards. Uh, church standards are a different thing. I don't really have time to get into that. I'll just leave that at get with the program. If your church has certain standards, get with the program. Whatever church you go to, they, those standards are there for a reason. You know what? They're there for, to keep unity. This whole, this whole sermon is about unity. It's not about doing your own thing. It's not about, you know, I'm going to live my best life now and do whatever I want. It's about thinking about other people first and foremost. So always keep that in mind. Um, the next sub point is forming cliques. Forming cliques. Now, we're a very small church. Um, this obviously isn't an issue. Everyone talks to everyone around here. Obviously, the ladies usually stick with the ladies and the guys with the guys. But there's no cliques here. And... I love that, but we're going to get bigger at some point, and we're going to start, you know, as we do more soul winning and as we get more people from either online or in person or whatever, the church is going to start growing, and that's when you start to get uh, clicks start to form. Um, now, I'll go into exactly why those actually start to form so we can actually sort of have a defense against that. So turn to Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4, 8. So Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, I don't know about you, but I just saw positive things there. Did anyone see any negative things? I didn't see negative things, right? So, Pastor brought this point up a few sermons ago, and it was a, a really good point. Um, but being critical of others and having an inability to be long-suffering leads to uh, clicks. So if you're a very critical person, a hypercritical person of other people, you're going to start forming cliques. I've seen it time and time again. So, and if you don't know how to learn how to be long-suffering, um, that's another issue. I'll get into that in a second. But long-suffering is being, putting up with people when they're the least uh, likable. Let's just put it that way, right? And so if you have a, a, a low capacity to be long-suffering, you're going to be, what? You're going to be very critical of that person. And then you're going to start forming cliques. Start being with people that only you like to hang out with. So stop focusing on bad qualities of others. And also stop only hanging out with people that share your views and thoughts. So you're not going to, uh, going to grow nearly as much uh, if you're always hanging out with people you're com comfortable with. Right? Does a weightlifter always lift the same weights, the same, um, you know, the same pounds, they see he's lifting like 120 pounds, however much they lift, um, power lifter or whatever. It's probably very low for a power lifter, but let's just say 400 pounds. Is he going to, or 300 pounds or something, is he going to continue lifting 300 pounds for the rest of his life? Or is he going to keep put, adding on weight, becoming uncomfortable, more uncomfortable, more uncomfortable? It's the same way we should treat our, our Christian life, is we should never want, want to be comfortable in everything that we do. Um, today, before preaching this, actually, I had a, a horrible headache. And I thought, man, this is really going to get in the way of the sermon. And I had a bunch of other issues because I've been going through different diets and stuff lately, um, experimenting with different things. And I just thought, man, every day of this week and has been great. 
Like the last week or two has been great as far as my energy levels are concerned. Awesome, right? And then today comes around and all of a sudden I have this headache and things aren't working the way they should be, um, whatever. But then I thought to myself, I don't care. I wanna preach when I'm uncomfortable. I don't wanna preach when I'm super comfortable because God wants you, the only way you're gonna grow is just if you're uncomfortable. And God's gonna put you in places where he wants you to overcome that uncomfortability and so you can be stronger. And so um, I thought that was, that was awesome. I'm like, I'm just gonna use this as, as uh, again, going back to Philippians 4.8. Take the good from the bad. Focus on the good things, whether it's on uh, good situations, I mean bad situations, um, bad you know elements at church or whatever, and then focus on the good things, right? So, all that to say is that you should be hanging around more people that you're not so uh, that you don't think alike, and you're not um, you don't maybe align on everything 100% because that person can sharpen you. I've seen this so many times. Um, I've hung out with so many times I never. Uh, so hung out with so many different people that I never thought I would hang out with, and I'm always learning something new. It's pretty awesome. Uh, Galatians 5.22, I think you have a marker there in Galatians 5.25. Uh, so let's go to Galatians 5. And the verse is um, 22, Galatians 5.22. So we need to be long-suffering. If you find yourself starting to form cliques, that's a clear sign that you're too critical of others and you lack the ability to be long-suffering towards people who need it the most. Who need it the most. There's a lot of people out there that might not have likable features, likable um, characteristics. They're not going to get any better if you're always shunning them and telling them to go hang out with other people that are, you know, that are like themselves. you got to think that sometimes you're got to word this correctly here. Sometimes you're put in the place to suffer people, to be, to be long-suffering towards people that normally you wouldn't want to hang around for their benefit. It's not for your benefit. You know, what are you going to get um, from hanging around with people that maybe not, might not be as mature as you? You're really going to just, you're doing that for their sake and for their sake, um, first of all. So I know there's different kinds of people. We're going to have plenty of different kinds of people that come into this church that might not be well-rounded individuals, um, but we need to be long-suffering towards those people so they can actually grow. They might not have had people in their life that were long-suffering towards them. That, that's probably why they're, they're, they are the way they are. You know, Internet people are a perfect example, <laughs> perfect example of this. Um, they tend to just be on the Internet all the time, looking up all these weird doctrines and all these, these stupid things, Nephilims, whatever. And, you know, when you hear them talk, it's sometimes you're like, what's wrong with you, <laughs> right? <laughs> you spent way too much time on the Internet, buddy. And it's like, get out, of that, get out of your mom's basement and, you know, get into a good Bible-believing church. But sometimes those people actually do come to church. And um, there's people, I've met lots of people that, that uh, come to church with their pet doctrine, right? Whether it's um, things on, you know, either the vaccine or that country in the Middle East that I'm not going to name, um, Israel and all these other you know doctrines all they do is focus on those doctrines and you'll meet these people that come to a good church and then two or three years down the line they're still talking about that pet doctrine it's like grow up be mature but there needs to be people that are um, willing to be long-suffering towards those people and that's kind of an extreme case that they would be that far into a good church and still talking about like their pet doctrines but we just need to be long-suffering towards people especially in the beginning so that they can grow um, you know, Pastor uh, Bruce Mejia used to say that church is a great normalizer, so it should be used to normalize people. You shouldn't be coming to church with your pet doctrine and then, you know, you're just on that week after week after week. It's like, can you talk about something else? But sometimes you just have to suffer it and help them to grow into different parts of the Christian, Christian life. There's all kinds of different things that we could be focusing on, and, you know, that, is, that doesn't come overnight, right? It starts with you guys. You guys being long-suffering towards those people. You guys teaching those people and giving them, sharing them doctrines and um, helping them get into other stuff in the Bible. So um, that's a, a very important thing. And the reason why I focus on those two things is because I, it's just it's extremely easy for us as humans to want to look at other people, say they're different from me, 
and then just say, I want nothing to do with them, right? If we say, no, that's not the case, we're just lying to ourselves. That's how we are. We just want to hang around similar people. I mean, to an extent, it's kind of good because obviously you don't want to, you don't want to be yoking up with a bunch of um, people that don't have the same beliefs, especially on the gospel, right? So it's a good thing. We're all here in unity, but within the body of Christ, we should have a, uh, we shouldn't be, you know, looking at all, all the different members and, and uh, picking on their obvious flaws, right? We all have flaws. So um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. So just one more thing in 1 Corinthians 14 to tie up this particular point. 1 Corinthians 14, um, verse 26. It says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. So this goes back to not just hanging around people that you're comfortable with. Every one of you guys, God has given you guys some ability, uh, whether it's, you know, singing, whether it's coming up with a good doctrine. I know there's a lot of people here that I've, I, I've talked to, and it's like I learn things new every week, like really edifying stuff. And so we can't actually edify each other if you're always just hanging out with the same people in a clique. So the reason why you guys are here in this church is because not only um, you obviously you're Bible believing Christians, but you have something that you could give to other people, whether it's a psalm, a doctrine, a revelation, um, all these different gifts that we might have to help build up the body of Christ. So that's not going to happen if you're hanging out and hanging around in your little clique. Uh, point number two. Point number two. Uh, let's go to James three. James three. Now this is a big one because a lot of the divisions and heresies, yeah, it starts from the heart, but it comes out the mouth right and obviously you don't want people hanging around here that don't believe like you do I've heard um, I heard a story that one guy was in a new IP church he was there for like two or three years or something and then he ended up turning out to be like a Catholic turned out to be a full-blown Catholic and he's like oh I, I enjoy the preaching but I think I'm gonna go to the Catholic Church now and so like obviously there's people that can just stay in a church and not say anything so you're not gonna know but for the most part, um, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so we want to keep, keep our mouth, our, keep our tongue under control here. So let's read James 3, 1 through 6. Uh, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and also uh, able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set, and it is set on fire of hell. And so, the main uh, first point for uh, this first sub point for point number two, the fool underestimates the power of the tongue, and church unity rests on the taming of our tongues. So. Everything, all the things that we've talked about so far, obviously things that come out of our heart, but they come out of our mouth. Um, turn to Proverbs uh, 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Proverbs 18, verse 21 reads, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So 
I mean, I've seen people lose friends over mere sentences. Mere sentences. And obviously there's things that lead up to that. It doesn't just happen overnight. But still, I mean, there, if you would only keep control of our tongue, we can actually extend those relationships. We can work on those relationships. But if we're too quick with our tongue, then that's when we start to lose friends. We start to cause divisions. Um, I've seen it my whole life, you know, just growing up. I mean, this is, think about a family, right? In a family, um, I got saved much later in life, and, you know, everyone has a, uh, might have a similar, uh, have grown up in a similar situation, but my family aren't like Bible-believing Baptists, necessarily. They're saved, um, my parents. But the, the family around it, all they do is bicker, all they do is um, backbite, all they do is complain, all they do is cause division. There's no unity in, in, in um, some of our families. We all know that. We have, we have those um, divisions due to what we believe. But the same thing can happen in a church. So if we're not careful with the things that we say, then we could end up um, causing a bunch of divisions in, our, in the church itself. So, and I just kind of want to contrast this with preaching the gospel. So we preach the gospel every week, giving new life and a new spirit to the most hopeless of people through the words of Jesus Christ. So think about that for a second. We can do such great things with our tongue and give life ha through the words of Jesus Christ, speaking life to people. They're, they can become born again, saved believers. Now, what's the opposite of that? You can actually cause people to, you know, um, let me just put it this way, self-slaughter themselves, right? This, we've heard all, of all these stories online. Um, you, know, you know, I'm not going to get into, like, not being offended by stuff and all that. But the point is, a lot of people do take their lives because of just things they've heard online or whatever. Or some people will tell them. A bully will tell some kid at school a bunch of... Um, garbage and that kid ends up taking his life right so the tongue is powerful and only the fool underestimates the power of the tongue um, and I've had I've heard of people going the opposite direction somebody's on the brink of self-slaughter and somebody helps them through the through kind words to bring them back from the brink and now they have a whole life to live and you know they have a family or whatever the case is but point being I just want you to focus on those extremes of the tongue and how much damage they can do and how much life it can give, right? Proverbs, let's turn to Proverbs uh, 16. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, uh, 27 says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. So this is the person that's that's um, always talking trash on people, always trying to bring things from people's past, always trying to find something, for whatever reason, whatever the case is. But that person, you'll notice two things. They love bringing up evil on other people, bringing up their past, and you know, trying to find uh, the chink in the armor. But you'll also notice that those people also gossip a lot, right? So in their mouth, uh, is a, on their tongue, is or on their lip is a um, burning fire and what that means is basically they're always constantly they always need to bring up some evil they always need to talk some evil about somebody and so let it never be said of us that we're always talking evil about people always um, bringing up people's past or whatever you know all those things they happen in the past and you know we're trying to move forward our whole Christian life is trying to move forward you know I just talked to somebody about this recently got some guy saved um, I think it was on Saturday or something, got him saved, and I told him, I said, hey, you know, the one thing that's probably going to keep you away from the Christian life, first and foremost, is going to be your past. And so thinking about your past, if you dwell on that too long, it's going to bring you down. And so why would you want to bring that up to other people and talk about their past and tell other people about their past and have that go around the church? All you're going to do is cause divisions. All you're going to do is cause discord and you're going to cause brothers. You're going to offend them. You're going to cause them to drop out of the, of the Christian fight. And so there's no reason to bring up other people's, uh, bring up past and dig up evil on people. It's just a, it's a super wicked thing to do. Uh, Proverbs 10. Let's turn to Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10. 
Proverbs chapter number 10, uh, verse 19. Proverbs 10, verse 19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. And so, I mean, I've seen this my whole life. Just, um, yeah, people talking. Think about it this way. You go to work, you talk to a few people at work, and these are worldly people, right? Most of the people you work with aren't saved. How long does it take for them to say something that's sinful? One minute, five minutes, ten minutes? I bet you anything it's under five minutes, under ten minutes, right? Um, I can just tell you by experience it's probably under one minute. And I'm, I'm not even making a joke. It's under, it can be under one minute. And so... Um, Think about that in, in relationship to saved believers. We can go a little bit longer with talking and having conversations and having a multitude of words without sinning. But I guarantee you that if, if you're talking to somebody for hours and hours and hours and hours, there's going to be something sinful. Guarantee it. And anyone that says, well, no, you know, I can do that and, and I'm good to go. There's no sin, sinful thing that comes up. Um, they're lying to themselves. All they're doing is trying to make trying to find all these gray areas and say, well, this is not sin and that's sin. They're trying to justify themselves, basically. And so, um, you know, the reason why I, I try to keep my conversations short, because I just know by personal experience, the more somebody talks, the more, the more sinful things come out. And so, and obviously, like at church, we have fellowship. Um, that's not usually the case here. We're talking to multiple people. Everyone here talks to everyone else. Uh, the guys go from guy to guy, have these different conversations. Um, and I see that as a good thing because usually when there's just a couple people talking for hours on end, there's going to be something sinful that comes up. And just, you know, next time you, well, hopefully you don't do it, but if that happens and you're talking to someone for hours and hours on end, do a self-examination. Be honest with yourself. What kind of things came up in that conversation that were sinful? Was there digging up evil? Was I saying something that I shouldn't have said? Was it X, Y, or Z? Whatever. Point being, there's always something simple that comes up in, in a multitude of words. And so I always try to keep my conversation short. You know, sometimes my family will be like, you know, Benjamin, you don't really talk a whole lot anymore. What's going on? And it's why, well, this verse right here, you know, this verse right here is why I don't talk a whole lot. It's because I know for a fact, I got saved later in my life. Let that sink in. So I'm just trying to correct for um, that life that I was living before. And I know this first for a fact that in a multitude of words, um, there is sin. There wanteth not sin. There's no lack of sin is what that means. Uh, go back to Galatians. Uh, actually, hold on one second. Yeah, Galatians 5.20. Galatians 5.20. <laughs> Galatians 5.20 says, Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. So what are seditions? Seditions are basically sowing seeds, seeds of rebellion in a group of people. Um, especially against church authority. And so, uh, again, um, these are like people that make negative, offhanded remarks about their church, their church leaders, sowing little seeds of discourse here and there through different people, different avenues. And that all adds up. All that adds up. And um, again, we're going to have more people coming to this church. We're going to be, this church is going to be growing. And that's going to be a harder thing to keep track of and to keep control of. Uh, you want to nip this thing at the butt, right? Right from the get-go. And so you don't want to, um, I'm sorry, you want to have, you know, yeah, have self-assessment on yourself, but listen to what other people are saying. You know, if they're starting to sort of badmouth the pastor, they're starting to, um, you know, be passive-aggressive towards the pastor, keep an ear on that. You know, that can actually grow up and, and turn into something worse. And it will with the big church. Once the church gets bigger, um, and it, obviously it's even happened in smaller churches before, um, you know. So 
the more you, you're vigilant about that, the more you can actually be proactive about it and do something about it um, before it turns into a big thing. And a lot of times, you don't necessarily have to go to, um, you know, go to a pastor or whatever. Um, I mean, if obviously it's a big enough deal, go to the pastor. I just mean if, if certain people are starting to get um, disenfranchised or starting to go turn negative, have a conversation with that, with that person. It doesn't always necessarily mean that they have uh, evil intentions, but it can start developing into evil intentions. And, that's a, and that, it gets to a point where, yeah, you have to go to the pastor. You have to tell them, hey, this guy is starting, you know, he's turning into a Cora, and he's starting to turn rebellious or whatever the case is. Uh, but you can always have a, a conversation with those kinds of people. You can edify them. You can exhort them. You can uplift them. And uh, you can kind of take care of that right then and there. But just know it can develop in, into something much more worse. And go to Numbers um, chapter 16. Numbers 16. We'll give an example of it. So there's always varying degrees on stuff. Uh, you know, we're humans. Sometimes we, you know, we complain or we murmur about stuff. Uh, the important thing is that you catch that quick. You catch it. Do a self-assessment. Understand, hey, I shouldn't be complaining. I shouldn't be murmuring or whatever. And then move, move on. Um, number 16, 1 through 2 says, Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. So it says these people here um, were actually men of renown. What, what does that mean? They were actually men of uh, good, uh, great report, men that were kind of famous in the congregation. So here's an interesting thing. If you notice somebody come into a church and they just start looking for the praise of men and they start looking to glorify themselves and they start looking to be that, that hot shot, that number one, that's, a, that's an issue. This is what Korah did. Um, look at verse number 11 here. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? So this is the important part to understand is that whenever they, all these seditions start and all these um, rebellions start, ultimately it's against the Lord, especially in a good Bible-believing Baptist church. It's always against the Lord. And so we have a good man of God. He's doing the work. He's leading an army. And then you have people backbiting him, people causing issues. That's not against the pastor per se. Ultimately, it's against Jesus Christ, right? And so uh, we've seen things like that happen before, and we know how that can end up. Um, and just as a side note, notice how they were 250 princes, men of renown. Uh, what does that tell you? It tells you they had influence over, over other people. So they go from group to group to group. Um, you know, fortunately, there won't be any cliques. Uh, ideally, there won't be any cliques. But it's going from group to group to group and sowing little seeds of discord. That person is he's well, well known in the congregation, so he has influence, right? So just know that if you start to notice something, uh, within a group of people, a rebellious group of people, these people didn't just think this overnight. Oh, you know what? Uh, I just woke up one day and I'm going to start rebelling against Moses and the Lord, right? So what does that tell us? That um, these things were it all, it'll basically all compacted little, uh, little by little by little, and that there's also more people that were affected than you think. So you see a tree growing, a, a corrupt tree. Well, what's under that? What's under the ground? A bunch of roots, right? You have a bunch of roots of different people, and I've heard this story so many times. I don't even, you know, I, ca I don't care to uh, recall the times I've heard this, but you know, you have that main man of renown, and then you have all these people under him who does his bidding, or they help to cause divisions here and there. So just know if you see somebody like that, there's always other people that he has influenced. It's not, it's not just the one person. Then you have to start worrying. Well, who else is infected? And obviously that, that'll be made manifest. Some people can be brought back from that. Other people can't. And then they just grow a uh, root of bitterness, and it turns into um, a bigger situation. So just always be aware 
be thinking, uh, be forward thinking about that kind of thing. Uh, and finally, let's go to Proverbs 11.13. Proverbs 11.13. Proverbs 11.13 reads, A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. And so, talebearing hurts people more than you would think. So, whenever you're thinking about something in the Bible, about a, a certain doctrine, like uh, speaking evil or, um, you know, trying to be a sanctified person, you always need to be thinking about other people. Stop thinking about yourself for a moment. Start thinking about other people. Now, the, the example of tail-bearing, now obviously, if you're going out and, and tail-bearing, you're hurting people locally, right? But then you're hurting people in the future as well. You're hurting people that could actually be helped. And what, am I, what do I mean by that? Let's just say somebody, I have a sin that I was struggling with, and I, and I you know, overcame that sin, right? And another brother has a similar sin, of, uh, let's just say the same sin that he's been struggling with. Now what if I am a tail bearer? Would you ever go to me for advice? No. Why? Because you know I'm just going to talk about other people. I'm just going to tell other people all your garbage. All, I mean, I'm trying to help you, but I'm just basically, if you go to me, I'm the big tail bearer I'm just going to go to other people and tell, hey, so-and-so has this problem, you know, go tell this group so-and-so has this problem, and everybody knows in the church. Now, that person could have gone to you for help, and he could have been, you know, he could have uh, been helped and got his life together, but he chooses not to go to you because you, you're a tail bearer, right? So think ahead. It's like chess, right? Think a few moves ahead and just understand that if you're, you know, if you're tail bearing, yeah, you're hurting people in the, in the here and now uh, locally, but you could also be hurting people down the line because maybe you have something you can help somebody out with, but they don't want to go to you because they know all you're going to do is just tell, reveal their secrets. So they can't go to you in confidence. Um, so now you're rendered useless. You can't help that person. And now that person maybe struggles with that even further, right? And there's all kinds of different um, sins we can think about, um, X, Y, or Z sins. But the point being is that um, if you're not a tail bearer, you can actually help people out because they'll go to you. They don't have to worry about you ever um, revealing all their secrets. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, point number three. So I kind of wanted to uh, just put this all together with uh, an object lesson. Um, so for those of you, uh, Ashley's not here and uh, Brother Luke, so they're not going to, basically, you know, their ears are really well tuned. They're going to be able to tell what I'm doing. So, um, so basically, right here, I'll, I'll just give you an example, right? This is a C chord right here. So you guys hear that C chord, right? So hopefully none of you are like, that's kind of out of tune. So um, if any of you guys grew up play music, you can probably tell, which I'm, so, you know, don't ruin my, my object lesson here, guys. But um, this is a C chord, okay? So what I'm going to do is slightly put out of tune one of these chord, one of these um, strings here. Can you tell the difference of what I just did? Who can, anyone can tell the difference? Can you hear the difference between the last chord, the first chord I played, and the other one? I'll play it again. Does it sound the same? More alike? Uh, more, more or less? Does it sound the same? Or can you tell? I'll do it again. Sound the same, more or less, from the last one I did? Okay, one more time. All right. So it's a, G, it's a G chord, actually. I said C chord. So kind of sounds the same, right? All right, now let's 
do this. It's an obvious difference, right? And it doesn't sound nice either. My point is, is that's exactly how that happens in a church. You don't notice it at first. Little by little, it's incremental. You don't notice it. Somebody starts sowing seeds of discord, whether it's heresies, whether it's um, you know gossip or whatever the case is. You're not going to notice that at, no, notice that at first, right? Um, are you, you you actually should notice it, and I'll get to that in a second. But for the most part, these things happen subtly, and so you know what can we do about that? Well, here I'll, I'll bring my guitar out again. So now I'm just going to do one string here. And for those of you who know, this is a guitar tuner. And it'll show me exactly how much this is out of tune. So that's an E. That's an E right there. The note is an E. And if I even go a little bit, this thing shows me even just the slightest amount it shows me and that's exactly how we should be um, as a church that's how we, sh we should be as people now let's go back let's go to Hebrews 412 and how do you get this sensitivity the same kind of sensitivity that that guitar tuner has um, Hebrews 412 says for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the, uh, the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not only your heart, but other people's hearts too. So the more sensitive you are, the, the easier it's going to be for you to call this stuff out when it happens. So just like that guitar, when I was playing that chord out of tune, some people could hear it, some people couldn't. This is not a, a judgment of how, you can, how quickly you can catch um, seditions and all that stuff. What I'm saying is that if you're not always in your Bible, if you're not always in the Word, you're not going to be able to hear that. And then it's, like it's going it's to get to a point where it's just too late, and then boom, you turn into the Church of Corinth. right? I went to the Church of Corinth way, way back um, when I, <laughs> before I was even saved. Right, I call it the Church of Corinth because there was a bunch, and I don't know if it was a saved church or not. I mean, it was, it was, it was weird. I mean, there was people. Um, the church was all divided with different doctrines. There was people backbiting, people gossiping. Um, they had this lady who would pretend to be, to speak for God, and she would lay her hand over you, and she would start speaking instead of God. It was just crazy. It was, it, but everyone was divided. It was like it was the, the best example of the Church of Corinth that I can think of. Everybody was just divided. They were doing the Lord's Supper like every month, and people would go up not knowing what they were actually doing. So of course you had people that were sick all the time. Um, it was yeah, not a not a good place to be. But if there was if people were actually sensitive enough to tell when these things were were um, you know going south then we could have, they could have done something about it. And again, I don't know if it was a safe church or not. I have, you know, I've got mixed um, answers from people at that church. But point being is that if you want to be as sensitive towards all this stuff, towards the heresies, towards the, the gossip, towards the seeds of discord, um, the seeds of rebellion, the seeds of, um, you know, seditions, then like that guitar tuner is, as soon as it, hit, it hears the bad note, it, t it can tell right away. That's the same way you need to be. And the only way you're going to be like that is if you actually, you're in your Bible every day, you're reading the Word of, of God, you're in Proverbs, you're just all over the Bible every day. Make some time. Don't be lazy. Put that time in so that you can actually be as sensitive to these things as possible because it, it's a group effort, right? So we need to all be sensitive and put an end to this stuff before it turns into something big. And we need to all be extremely sensitive to um, seeds of discord in this church, in every like-minded church. Otherwise, it's going to turn to the Church of Corinth, and God forbid, you know, that ever happens. But it can happen. I mean, we have all kinds of testimonies in the Bible about that. 
So don't ever think that just because we're a, a, just a, a, an awesome soul winning church that that can't change. The church that I went to uh, years and years ago before I was saved, if they were a saved church, they said they used to actually go knocking door to door. Now, I'm going to get into that point. This is the final point that I'm done. But um, they, they did go door to door. And if they were a saved church, they probably got people saved. So what happened? Uh, final point here is let's turn to um, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, and let's look at verse 32 through 34. So, if we become divided, who do we really hurt? Who do we really hurt? First Corinthians 15, 32 through 34 says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, I'm not going to go into the context of this um, passage. It's talking about the um, you know, resurrection and people basically um, heresies about the resurrection. But this is a great standalone verse. Look, go ahead and look at number 33 again. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So what is this really saying? What this verse is actually saying is that um, the evil things that we speak and do, the evil things that we say can spoil a Christian. It'll take, it'll rob him of his zeal to get other people saved. So when you start having heresies and you start uh, having all these divisions, all you're going to do is cause a stumbling block for other people, and then they're going to stop getting people saved. They're going to stop um, doing things for God, doing good works for God, because of the things we said. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You can also think of that as evil communications corrupt good works is another way to think of it. But good manners is the things that we do, the good things that we do. And the things that we say can cause a, cause a brother to, to be offended and stop soul winning, stop going to church, whatever it is. And then um, ultimately, ultimately, who does that hurt? Does it, yeah, it hurts us. It hurts the church. But it's hurting all those people out there that aren't saved and they haven't heard the gospel yet. Um, unfortunately, you know, I've met people like that. You know, just to wrap up the sermon is... You know, I met somebody, uh, I've talked to people like that, where they were like, well, no, this guy is, um, I don't really like hanging around with them because X, Y, and Z. And he didn't go soul winning with them for, I don't know how long, maybe a week, maybe two, who knows. But all I know is that on that day, or on those mul multiple days it might have been, that guy stayed home from soul winning just so he wouldn't hang out with the guy that he didn't get along with. Who did that hurt? Did it hurt them? Maybe for a season. But there's plenty of people out there that could have gotten saved that day and they didn't hear the word. So just remember who, who we're actually hurting when we um, sow seeds of discord or when we allow this stuff to happen in our church. Because it's not just hurting us. Always think about other people. Put other people before yourselves. Understand. Think forward. It's a chess game. We're hurt. The things we do today can either be a positive effect or have a negative effect on the people out there, on our families people around us, all our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? It's not just about us. It's not live your best life now. It's help other people um, get saved, you know, get discipled, become better Christians. So all this discord stuff, um, you know, help us to be sent. Let's just learn to be sensitive towards it and understand who it's really affecting. So I'll just clo uh, close with a word of prayer.